We all need food to live, but millions of people also produce food to make a living. Here in Africa, agriculture is still the most important economic activity and it provides employment to up to two thirds of the continent's population. Welcome to Echo Africa. I am Chris Elams. And I am Sandra Twinovium. Today, on this special edition of our program, we are focusing on rethinking agriculture and we'll learn about how we can farm more sustainably and keep the world fed. Here is a quick look at what is coming up. We see how a farmer in Germany is converting to wet agriculture. We'll also hear about a fruit known as the black gold of Cyprus. And we learn how tiny helpers are working to combat a pesky plant in South Africa. We start today's show right here in Uganda. Here in the country, we produce a wide range of agriculture products like corn, sweet potatoes, sorghum, coffee and tea, to name just a few. But just how those crops are farmed can have a big effect on the health of the soil as well as the harvest, as we'll see in our first story. These farmers have never looked so closely at earthworms. I have always regarded these worms as dangerous. I will not have them in my garden. Whenever I see them, I get rid of them. But these worms play an important role. They help to compose plant debris with their excrements, they enrich the soil. To pass on this knowledge, the biologist and founder of an NGO for sustainable land use, Ali Tebandeke, gives regular training courses like this one. This morning, uh, we, we are learning about uh, vermicomposting. How can we uh, try to amend our soils using ready wigglers? They are capable of producing for us those soil amendments, the likes of warm castings. Fertilizer can now also be obtained from green waste. The liquid is then simply added to water used for irrigation. It's a very cheap and environmentally friendly fertilizer. In his training sessions, Ali Tabandeke explains how elements of nature work in symbiosis. Each plant and animal has an important role to play. We look at the food forest system. We have the short ones, then you could see we have the tall ones, and then we have the, the understory plants. That means that each one is contributing to each other. Where we have the, the natural hedgerow of the vetiver, it collects and also acts as a habitat for small insects that could contribute to beneficial insects that could deter or that could reduce the population of the dangerous pests. The farmers need to know how even minor human interventions can upset nature's balance. Experts believe it can weaken ecosystems and make them more vulnerable to climate extremes. Biodiversity in the fields is also better for humans. Studies by UNICEF, for example, show that small farmers with few crop varieties in their fields often suffer from poor nutrition. Scientists from Uganda have confirmed this. In African context, you realize that also in the region here in Toro, people eat what they produce. And the person is producing one person, five acres. But on that five acres, what else is there? Do you have the legumes? Do you have beans on the same farm? Do you have animals on the same farm? Do you have lentils on the same? Do you have vegetables on the same? So if we are talking about diversity, we are talking about diversity on the farm, which is actually supposed to translate into diversity on the plate and also diversity in the market. On the course, farmers learn why it's important to leave trees in their fields or to plant new ones. Farmer Abubakar Kajubi has implemented this idea and planted jackfruit trees among his vegetable crops. I have kept the trees because they are crops which grow well in shade. These trees act as windbreakers. I even use other plants as a source of herbal medicine to treat my family against illnesses like coughs. 
ngeri echifuba nga chikwe gambe dagala ndiko sange dagala Ali Tebendeke has trained around 200 farmers in the last three years. He has also founded a savings group offering microcredit to members. Some can even trade their produce in the community. There are certain people who may not be interested into farming, but using such avenues, it becomes something that can spark off someone's attention towards farming and then also towards being environmental conscious. <laughs> Alita Bendeke is convinced that biodiversity in fields is better for everyone, both for people's health and for nature. Wow, what an inspiring example of modern agriculture. Our next report comes from Europe. You may never have heard of the carob tree, but it is an undemanding plant and also grows in the dry regions. The fruit is edible, but not all farmers know what they're good for. In Cyprus, a young man is following in his grandfather's footsteps and harvests the fruit, which is made into different products. And it turns out that keeping all traditions alive is definitely worthwhile. Every year, Theophanus Christo helps out with the harvest. His family taught him everything he knows about the carob tree. The pods are ground into a powder that's a popular substitute for cocoa. It's used as a sweetener, too, and also as a natural adhesive. Christo is studying finance, so he knows a lot about markets. For decades, carob prices have been low, 35 cents per kilo. Because of the war in Ukraine, the price of a kilo of carob reached 85 cents this year and is expected to reach one euro per kilo. Anyone who harvested carob this year will have an enormous income because you don't spend money on growing carob, you just harvest it from trees and transport it to mills. Cultivating carobs has zero expenses and it's profitable. Carob trees have been cultivated on Cyprus for some 3,000 years. Many local families with their roots on the island own carob plantations, like George Patihis. This is the way that these uh, trees here, which is an area of about two hectares, were planted by my grandfather. We go back more than 100 years ago. Once the ponds have been harvested, the farmer takes them to the mill in the coastal town of Zihi. For centuries, carob ponds, known locally as black gold, were one of Cyprus's main exports. In the last century, Cyprus was the world's third largest carob producer. These days, carob cultivation is no longer as lucrative as it once was, but many families have kept up the tradition. I am the last generation. My children have other jobs, they are not, uh, uh, they don't mind about the agricultural crops because they don't pay. But now Carob is making a comeback. Demand has risen in recent years, not least because the flour from the pod is increasingly used in vegan cuisine, as well as various diets. The plant is versatile and can be used in its entirety, from the fruit to the seeds. In Anoyira, in the south of the island, carob products are ubiquitous and a staple at the local market. The government has become more aware of their value too. The agriculture minister plans to boost carob production on the island. Carob production is very important for Cyprus because it doesn't need much insecticide, fertilizer and water. This is important in terms of climate change. It's also important because you can create a huge range of products from the carob. Carob can be found in products such as candy, syrup and baked goods, and it could once again become a prized export. And if demand continues to grow, more carob trees will be planted. Reviving carob cultivation would be an investment in sustainable farming. It was profitable in the past and could be profitable in the future. 
Staying in Europe and talking about an ecosystem that is a climate wonder, peatlands are absolutely amazing. They store insane amounts of carbon in their soil. By the way, the biggest peatland in Africa is in the DRC. It is the size of England and Wales combined and stores almost 20 million tons of carbon. Well, the problem is, Sandra, we are destroying peatlands at a crazy rate and mostly just to extract resources or plant crops. But that releases enormous amount of CO2. The thing is, there is no need. We can do both. Save one of the most effective carbon storage systems in the world and fund them at the same time. Let's take a look. To find out how that's supposed to work, we came here, a farm in Germany's east. All of this used to be conventional, so dry, farmland. But in 2015, it got turned back into peatlands, wet farmland. And this is Sebastian Petri, the guy who's in charge of it all. He re-wetted his 107 hectares completely. Petri mainly grows marsh grasses to sell as horse feed. But operating in the wet, you need, well, special equipment. It's a former snowcat that used to groom ski runs. It had to be completely rebuilt. The chains had to be completely replaced. On a mountain you have these aluminum bars which are quite aggressive, allowing you to drive up the mountain. But we want to work as gently as possible on the ground, so we installed wide steel struts instead. To keep his fields wet, Petri needed to completely close down his drainage system that runs through his fields. The solution was quite simple. He barricaded the gates with wood. Easy and effective. Plus, extremely helpful in dry summers. In years like we're having now with this drought, this water here is worth its weight in gold. If we retain the water here over a large area, then everyone benefits from it. Because in the end, the water moves around. That is also an important function of the bogs. Not only carbon storage, but also as a water reservoir. Despite the enormous re-wetting efforts, the water level here varies a lot, from 50 centimetres above ground to 60 centimetres below during dry summers. This can still lead to CO2 emissions in peatlands, but how do peatlands trap carbon in the first place? So we just took this out of the ground and when you just grab this piece of earth and squeeze it, you can see how much water is coming out of that. And that's basically what makes peatlands so climate friendly, the water. Because below me are thousands of tons of dead plants, but because peatlands are wet, they don't decompose. The microorganisms who usually do that don't have enough oxygen to take care of that. So the carbon remains in the soil. And when all this dries up, the plants suddenly decompose much faster. And the oxygen in the air attaches to the carbon in the soil and you get CO2. And the scale is mind blowing. Between five and 10% of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions come from damaged peatlands. This new approach of combining agriculture with peatland meadows is called paludiculture, and this also has advantages in terms of productivity. In this way, I ensure that the degradation of my peatland is as close to zero as possible, meaning I still have an area on which I can continue farming. The other advantage is water retention. This means, even in the driest years, I can still get a decent harvest. And hay isn't the only thing you can produce on peatlands. Alternatives include common reed and bulrush, which is also grown in these pots here at the University of Greifswald, where scientists try to find out everything about growing stuff in wetlands. Here they scan roots and measure every millimeter of plant growth with these funky machines. They have X-ray vision. 
But wouldn't it be better environmentally if we'd give peatlands completely back to nature and not farm them? Well, as long as roots are being produced and the moor is wet, new peat should build up again. The most important thing is the water level. If the moor is wet, it's good for the climate. Whether we then farm it or not is just a question of what we want to do with it. So you don't need to revert completely to nature to reap benefits from the peatlands. A UK study looked at the climate effects of different water levels in peatlands. Raising the water level in degraded peatlands worldwide by a few centimetres would already reduce emissions by 65%. That represents 1.3% of global CO2 emissions. Sebastian Petri also owns 35 water buffaloes. They mature slowly, but every once in a while he slaughters them and sells the meat. He's been doing this for a fair while now. Does it pay off compared to intensive conventional farming? From a purely financial perspective, no. But when I think of it as an investment in the future, then yes, because I'm ensuring that the land will still be productive in 20 or 30 years' time. But compared to the revenues of intensive crop farming, the current cost of re-wetting peatlands and buying new machinery, most farmers will be better off financially if they stick with intensive farming. A way to make polluter culture more profitable would be that governments start paying for the climate benefits that re-wetted peatlands provide. This could help get more farmers interested in the idea of polluter culture and its environmental benefits. Something quite helpful when you know that 300,000 square kilometres of cropland need re-wetting globally. That's the size of Italy. Staying on the topic of rethinking agriculture, our next report comes from an area of Ivory Coast also struggling with severe drought. Some farmers there are now banding together to protect their fields from wind and unpredictable weather conditions. Here is this week's Doing Your Bits. How can we protect fields that are exposed to both drought and heavy rain? In northern Ivory Coast, farmers use two simple methods. The small stone walls they're building across their fields retain water. The walls don't run parallel, but snake back and forth. They use a level, not to check whether the ground is even, but to find out which way the land is sloping. The stones are then laid so that they will catch the water runoff. That allows us to fertilize the soil because the compost stays put and the ditches we have already dug can fill up with water. They have also planted trees to act as wind breaks. They are regularly pruned to keep them in check. The trees we planted help to shield the soil from the wind. The small walls we are building distribute the runoff so that the water doesn't wash away the soil and create deep channels, which would make the land useless in the long run. The farmers are now feeling more connected too. They realize they can only protect their fields together. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. In today's modern interconnected world, agriculture is a big business. Most of us have probably eaten food that our grandparents never even heard of or had the opportunity to taste. But as we ship produce and goods around the world, sometimes other plants and animals go along for the ride. And in some cases, that can cause huge problems in their new homes, as we'll see in our next report from South Africa. A green mass where open water should be. 
For decades, the problem at Hadebeesport Dam in northern South Africa has been growing exponentially. The lake is overgrown with water hyacinth, a plant from South America now clogging bodies of water throughout Africa. The invasive plant grows extremely fast. The ecological consequences are dramatic. Combating the plant has been difficult despite intense research. Water hyacinth is one of the world's most um, problematic aquatic weeds. It's been present on Hardapespa Dam since the 1970s, and it's a massive problem. Um, they've tried to remove it manually through herbicide applications, but it's still um, a massive problem. Um, and because it can cover up to 40% um, of the dam surface. Researchers in South Africa have been trying to control the invasive plant for years. Well sealed off from the environment, scientists are looking for the water hyacinth's natural enemies. And they've made a big find that's only four millimeters in size. The inconspicuous water hyacinth plant hopper is also a native of South America. The insects reproduce just as rapidly as the water hyacinths, and the little guys have a big appetite. One of the major concerns we have in biological control is that an insect that we release could feed another plant species. So we mitigate that in this facility by testing these candidate insects on various plant species, including native species and crop plants. And we need to do this testing to make sure that the insects that we release are what we call host specific. This testing is very thorough and sometimes can take years. It's important for this because once an insect is released, we can't get them back. The tests for the water hyacinth plant hopper are finally complete. The bugs are now being collected and packed for transport. Together with a leaf of their favorite food, they're on their way to the Hatebeesport Dam. Rosalie Smith of the Center for Biological Control sees to it herself that the insects reach their destination. The denser the water hyacinths grow, the better it is for their little enemy. They can multiply here quickly. Our approach with releasing the plant hoppers is using them as a green herbicide. So as many uh, as releases as possible early in the summer, uh, that allows the uh, populations to build up quickly. Um, and that also just um, allows them to damage the plants as soon as possible so that the plants don't expand their growth over the dam. Water hyacinths form dense mats that drift across the lake. When they collide, their underwater roots become entangled and block out any light. Gradually, a huge, dense carpet of plants forms. They can completely overgrow bay areas, which is not only an ecological problem, but an economic one too. Many people at the dam live from tourism. Each year, columns of workers remove the plants from the water with long rakes. It's a slow and laborious process that only works on smaller waters. In huge areas like this, though, the tiny helpers have to step in. The traces of their work can be seen on the water hyacinth's leaves. Holes and brown areas testify to the success of the organic pest control. The nibbled-on and dead plants drop to the ground and slowly decompose underwater. You can also see them from space. Within two years, the growth on the dam has decreased from 40 to just 5 percent. This is a site where we did frequent inundative releases of the plant hopper. Um, and we know they're here in high numbers because they jump around as I pick up a plant. Um, and what they damage look like is they cause the leaves to become brown. The leaves also um, recoil on themselves. Um, and so the plants in this site is heavily damaged, and that's basically what we would like for the rest of Harabespo Dam. In the evening light, the success of the operation can be seen particularly well. Swarms of plant hoppers fly over the water hyacinths. Nevertheless, the plant will probably never really disappear. It spreads too quickly. Even so, large open water areas have re-emerged on the Hardebeesport Dam since their introduction. 
This promising result could lead to the plant hoppers being used on other infested waters. Rethinking agriculture and how to use nature or plants in a different way is something that affects everyone around the planet. I hope you enjoyed our in-depth look at the topic. Sadly, it is time to say goodbye already. I am Sandra Twinovio in Uganda. Tune in next time next week. Thanks, Sandra. It's also time to say farewell from Nigeria. If you want to know more, join us on our social media or write to us. I am Chris Elems. Take care.